thank you everybody for showing up again and uh, for this third in our series. This morning, we're so fortunate to have Tanya Lama with us. Tanya uh, is actually a native New Englander. She was born in Connecticut, but very soon, uh, I don't know how old you were, you don't have to tell us, her parents took her to Mexico and there she stayed all through her elementary and secondary education. But she came back to New England for her master's degree at uh, Yukon Stores, Connecticut, and continued at UMass where she still is working on her second uh, postgraduate degree. And in the meantime, uh, correct me if I get any of this wrong, she had a chance to travel professionally into the Patagonia region of South America, Chile and Argentina, the uh, Amazon region of Peru, and Botswana, is that correct? Yep. In Africa, and these were all professional activities in these locations. And somewhere in there, she spent a sojourn in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and I think she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, a study she did with red squirrels up there. But the feature of her talk, of course, is the Canada Lynx work. Oh, I just introduced yet another country into your resume. <laughs> Mexico, U.S., Canada. You know, she's the original NAFTA scientist here. <clears throat> But her, uh, she, with a little help from colleagues, published the first entire description of the genome of the Canada lynx. So congratulations, Tanya, for that feat. Without further ado, Tanya Lama, PhD candidate, University of Massachusetts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about um, genomics as a tool in conservation, the different applications that we use genomes, and also a little bit about um, just the process of generating um, these genomes as tools that we can then use for conservation. And so I'll be sharing a little bit of the projects that I have ongoing, um, our new Canada lynx genome, which was just released a few months ago, our plans for using that um, to inform conservation um, in the Northeast and in Eastern Canada, um, and also a, a little bit of research here and there from um, prominent studies in our field from our colleagues, and also a little bit from Bill's um, son, Warren, actually, who has been um, a real mentor and an advisor to me um, as I've been learning about genetics and genomics. So, um, all right, so I'll start, um, just get a little bit of the boring stuff out of the way by talking to, about myself and introducing myself. So um, I'm in the last year of my PhD, my doctorate at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and I work within what's called the Massachusetts Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful, but basically this research unit is housed within the Department of Environmental Conservation at UMass, at UMass Amherst. And the unit and the scientists that work within the unit are really a powerhouse for applied conservation research. Um, and basically the research we do is all on resource management um, and each unit is kind of a collaboration between a state agency, so for example, Massachusetts um, Fish and Wildlife, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, House University, so we're at UMass Amherst, um, and there's 40 different units and 38 states across the entire United States, including Hawaii, um, and um, our units engage basically primarily in applied resource management research. So we're doing projects on moose, projects on bears, um, Canada lynx, bobcat, dam removal, if it's applied and relevant to conservation and not just thinking about, for example, um, you know, evolution or basic science, we're working on those types of projects. Um, 
Okay, so when people ask me about my job, <laughs> I might simply call myself a wildlife biologist, I might call myself um, a conservation geneticist. Um, I usually don't st you know, start with talking about genomics because a lot of people actually haven't heard about that field. It's only existed within the last like 30 years. Um, and so when people think about what I do, a lot of times they think, you know, I'm kind of handling and cuddling wildlife um, and, you know, handling all these cool exotic animals and hugging trees and encouraging people to recycle and being a climate activist. Um, and what I actually get up to is a lot more like this. So I do handle um, wildlife on occasion. I do go out into the field and do some work, but uh, the majority of the time I'm in the lab processing samples, I'm generating data, and then I'm taking a lot of time on my computer to analyze these massive data sets and to try and make sense of the complex um, environment that we're working in and to try and understand what we can do better. So how we can better understand, for example, the impacts um, and the threats that are impacting the persistence of our wildlife populations and what we can do about that. Um, and so I spend a lot of time analyzing data, writing reports, and most importantly, I always say the most important thing that I do is I take my research, and yes, I publish it, but beyond that, I translate my findings from my research and I communicate those with um, wildlife managers. And so wildlife management agencies like Mass Wildlife, um, Vermont Department of um, Fish and Wildlife, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries, those are some of our local um, Northeast wildlife agencies. Um, these management agencies need reliable scientific information upon which to base their decisions, execute strategies for managing and recovering wildlife populations. Um, and these range from, for example, if there's any sportsmen in, in the women, in the in sports, sportsmen, sorry, or sportswomen in the room, um, this includes decisions about like, for example, um, setting bag limits and setting season lengths for fishing, trapping, and hunting, and ensuring that um, each one of these seasons and each one of these species that are harvested um, are being harvested in a sustainable manner. So that's the type of action that we would inform. Um, the other kinds of plans and strategies that we would inform include, for example, recovery and monitoring species at risk. When I say species at risk, I'm talking about, for example, species that are either candidates for being listed under the Endangered Species Act at the federal level, um, or they've already been listed. They're somewhere within that process. Maybe there's um, a recovery plan that has been developed by experts and um, state wildlife managers are working through that plan and doing action on the ground, for example, um, habitat restoration to try and boost the recovery of that population. Um, so ultimately, science is at the core of the North American wildlife conservation model. Um, it has been since the onset, really, and it's the basis of what we do. So discovering new species, preventing extinction, achieving recovery where we can, um, establishing protected areas like wildlife reserves, um, and um, informing policies that help wildlife. All of that is based in science. And so this kind of represents um, the scientific process and the other pieces that come into play. So there's scientific information, there's public input, and there's a decision-making process that come together to generate um, these plans and policies that are then adopted by wildlife management agencies, um, which hopefully produce positive outcomes, so population recovery, sustainable harvests and bag limits um, for species that are harvested, and healthy ecosystem functioning for all of us. And so I work right here um, in providing scientific information through this process. And so my research really focuses on the application of genomic techniques um, to inform the management and conservation of wildlife populations. And so that means that I take a question or locate um, with my partners an area of, for example, a knowledge gap that needs to be filled. And I design and implement a study that might address that 
um, knowledge gap and assess the genetic makeup of individuals and populations. And so these studies, basically, they, they can do a lot of different things depending on what the question is. So we can determine species identity. We can determine the degree of hybridization. So when I say hybridization, for example, something relevant to my research is um, Bobcat and Canada lynx are two species that in the Northeast are existing at the northerly most and southerly most range limits of their species distribution. And so um, this is kind of a common phenomenon among um, felids that they will hybridize. And so there's been a handful of confirmed Bobcat Canada lynx hybrids, um, four of which were in Maine and a couple of which were also in Minnesota, which means that there's this interface, right, where these two species are co-occurring, they're sharing habitat, and at times they're also mating. And so something that we can look at through genetics is the degree to which this hybridization is occurring and what that means for the fitness of the animals um, that are produced through this process. Um, and so additional things that the, these types of studies can address are demographic history. So that means basically reconstructing um, for a population looking backward. So just like how you would do forecasting, it's similar, it's similar to forecasting but looking backward into the past. And so for demographic history reconstruction, we're saying what are, for example, the population bottlenecks, the historic population expansions and contractions that have contributed to what we're seeing on the ground today and the current status of genetic health in this population. Um, and so findings of these studies are then used to support wildlife management, planning, and conservation action. So that could be, for example, um, habitat management, recovery planning, and on the more extreme end of the spectrum, things like reintroductions or translocations. I should also mention that if there's any questions. Yeah, OK, yeah. We'll so just. which is actually giving birth? Is it the lynx or the bobcat? Do we know that? So I believe that it's male lynx and, or sorry, male bobcat, female lynx. Yeah, that would make sense. Yes. And so um, from the handful of confirmed hybrids that we have from the state of Maine, there was one individual that was then collared. And then the following spring, it looked like the, this is a hybrid individual, had had a, a litter of pups. And so really the question is, it seems like the hybrid individuals are actually fertile. And so one of the main questions that hasn't been addressed is to what degree is this happening in the natural environment? Um, and really the small handful of detections that we had were just animals that looked really weird. So, um, you know, someone, for example, a trapper, um, I just want to make one super quick distinction between bobcat and Canada lynx. Canada lynx are not trapped or hunted legally in the United States, in the contiguous US, um, but bobcat are. And so there's seasons, of course, when bobcat are being harvested. And the, there were just a handful of circumstances where, for example, because there's mandatory reporting, if you trap a bobcat, you have to go and get it tagged. Um, where the warden or whoever was on site was like, whoa, hold on, this looks really weird. Um, and so for my colleagues, they've told me that they actually handled the animals and have kept the pelts and whatever um, data they could on the animals. And just it, that was the first thing they picked up on was these animals had big paws, but they had the coloration of a bobcat. So they had, for example, you know, the, the, um, the um, tail coloration of a bobcat rather than a Canada lynx, but they have these big paws. And so anyways, so that's what led to some early recognition of hybridization among Canada lynx and bobcat. But genetics, using the tools that we had been using in the past um, you know, a couple decades, didn't allow us really to confirm whether, for example, the hybrid that we were seeing was what's called a first generation F1 hybrid, meaning it's a bobcat and a Canada lynx, or if they're the offspring, right? So, you know, maybe a, 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 a hybrid that had been back crossed and mated with a, with a bobcat or a Canada lynx. Anyways, so, yeah. Are there, uh, can, can you use your uh, genomic research on specimens in museums or pelts or old things that, that yes. are stored? Yes. Um, so the new genome research that I did, we'll talk a little bit about sample selection later. Um, 
Yeah, a, a museum specimen would not have worked for the specific application that I worked on, but there's certainly people who are using ancient DNA. So they're pulling material out of, for example, like pelts or museum specimens or um, just like older specimens, and they're looking at that to kind of get a snapshot of what um, some of these basically what the genetic makeup was of these individuals that existed sometimes hundreds of years ago. So, okay, all right, carrying on. Um, so findings from, the, findings from these studies then um, are taken and they are used to inform and support wildlife management planning and conservation actions. Okay, so how does all of this work? Well, basically your genome um, lives in the nucleus of every one of the cells within your body with the exception of your germline cells. So that means eggs and sperm. Um, and it, the genome contains what I like to call the blueprint for life. And so it's basically an organism's full set of DNA. Um, so all of the chromosomes of DNA and all of the information that they house. And it's kind of a genetic instruction manual. Um, for life. So it contains all of the information that an organism needs to um, basically build and maintain all of the forms and functions um, required to live out the course of its life. Um, and so in this case, the instruction manual is really, really long. The instruction manual or genome that I produce for Canada Lynx is 2.9 billion with a B base pairs long. Um, and basically each one of these genomes consists of four building blocks, A, C, T, and G. And this code varies really slightly um, between individuals and populations. And so within a single gene, we might find that some individuals are exhibiting a different variant. So the code is varying slightly within these genes from individual to individual or among populations. Um, so here's a quick, um, kind of example of what this genetic diversity looks like. So we're, ha we're looking, so this is the genome at the top. All of the chromosomes are just kind of hanging out and then we can zoom in to um, a single chromosome and within that chromosome locate the genes and also the intergenic region. So the intergenic region was what we used to call junk DNA. So we didn't think for a long time that it was really doing anything, that it was useful. Um, that it was really like an instruction manual for anything, okay? And then um, a couple decades ago, we realized that actually this intergenic region is really cool and really important, and it houses all kinds of information about, for example, regulatory regions. So the instructions for the instructions that say, for example, turn this gene on now, create this product, fix this, do that, turn this on or off, right? send this signal, let's start mating, let's migrate, all kinds of different things. Um, and so the intergenic region is full of all this really cool information that's regulating the important regions, which are the genes. And then within these genes, so let's say we zoom into a single gene and we find that some individuals have one variant, so the TAT variant and other individuals are just um, exhibiting a slightly different, so just a single, base pair difference within a gene. Because this genetic diversity is located within a gene, that means that individuals or the populations that are housing these two different variants might actually be producing, for example, different proteins, different products, and the, the expression of this gene might be different. So it might be, for example, coding for a different trait. Maybe that, coat, maybe that trait is like coat color in cats, um, or eye color, or hair color or behavior. Um, and so because this diversity is located within a gene, it's something that we would definitely be interested in looking at depending on what the function of that gene might be. And so this difference seems really small, but the cumulative effect of these small differences is actually pretty significant. So between all of us, between me and the person standing next to me, um, there's actually 12 million of these tiny differences between each one of us. Um, and those tiny differences are distributed across the entire, you know, 2.9 billion base pair genome that each of us has. So, another way to think about this um, is to imagine that the genome is a book. Um, the chromosomes are the chapters, so every species has a different number of chapters. Has anyone heard of 23andMe? 
So that's referring to how many chromosomes we have, right? So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, different species have different number of chromosomes. There is, that's an entire area of research in and of itself. Um, and the size of genomes varies really differently too. So just like the length of a book might be different. Um, some books are short, some books are long. Um, and that's another area of research. So I always, I remember when I found out that salamanders have some of the biggest genomes. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> they seem pretty basic. Um, but some, of the, some salamanders have genomes on the order of 13 billion base pairs long. So there's a lot of people that are interested in how genomes become big, how they become small, um, and kind of the architecture within each one of them. So. Would a bigger genome mean perhaps less flexibility of personal decision and more factors kind of built into your instruction manual? That's a good question. Um, when I think about sal salamanders, when I say they're pretty like basic organisms, I say that because, for example, um, evolutionarily, right, salamanders are pretty low on the totem pole, like their eggs, just in, in thinking about oviposition, right, so how organisms create and, and, and carry around their eggs, right, where do salamanders' eggs need to be? In water, that's pretty basic. That's, that's low tech, okay? High tech is, for example, humans who moved beyond eggs and we're carrying them within us and we're carrying fetuses within our bodies so that we can be highly mobile, right? We can go anywhere with them. Um, salamanders, for example, um, they're, just, they're just more basic organisms in that they've been around for a really long time, right? And so there's a couple different lines of evidence that suggest that um, the salamander genome just isn't purging stuff that it doesn't need, right? So people know about the appendix, right? The appendix, one of the hypotheses, I guess, about the appendix is that we used to use it as humans to process um, um, plants and stuff. We had a more herbivorous diet at one point, and so we used the appendix to process plants and, and woody materials and things, but we don't need that anymore, right? And so feasibly within our genome, there are genes that at one point regulated the things that our appendix did. But we don't need those anymore because we're not using our appendix. And so those genes have basically stopped working, right? Um, and so one of the hypotheses is that within the salamander genome, they have genes throughout the course of their evolution that they didn't need anymore, but they just not, never got rid of them. So they never got rid of that like junk DNA, so genes that stopped serving them. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so another way to think about this is that the genome is the book, the chromosome is the chapters, and genes are like sentences. And so changing a single letter in a sentence can actually change the meaning of the sentence. Um, so these are small variations. Here are two sentences. Um, so let's say within a gene, one sentence is the cat in the hat comes back. Um, and a single letter difference would be the rat in the hat comes back. Different meaning, right? Um, and so these small variations aren't always impactful to health. Like I mentioned, between each one of us, there's about 12 million of these tiny differences. But it's what makes me me, and it's what makes you you, right? Um, and so it gives me the traits that I have, and not all of these differences are impactful to health, right? So I have brown hair, I have brown eyes. Um, some of the impactful to health variants might be related to disease, right? So I might have a different susceptibility to certain diseases. Um, and so that's why in cumulatively, right, we love to look at these small differences because the collective impact of them can actually be really significant. Okay. So, um, how do we actually apply these genomes to conservation? Well, conservation is the study and management of wildlife populations, um, the habitat they rely upon, and also the threats that impact their likelihood to persist um, into the near and distant future. And so many of you might be familiar with some recent talk about the sixth mass extinction. Um, which is a major extinction event that scientists are sounding the alarm about currently um, due primarily to anthropogenic impacts on the environment. 
And this event has been characterized by a really worrisome rate of species extinctions and population declines, much greater than what we would expect under what's called background conditions. And so this is a quick figure that just displays the expected versus observed numbers of extinctions since 1900. Um, so for example, for mammals, which is what I have primarily worked on, we would expect 1.26 extinctions among mammals to go extinct in about 100 years. And we have observed and documented 35 mammalian extinctions since 1900. Um, and so some of the familiar species that have gone extinct since 1900 include, for example, the passenger pigeon, which people might have heard about, the Tasmanian tiger, the Japanese sea lion, um, and the western black rhinoceros. And so genomics has been used to basically better understand how these major threats to biodiversity so we're talking about, for example, climate change, environmental pollutants, um, over har harvesting, habitat fragmentation, habitat loss are impacting wildlife and causing these populations to decline and ultimately in some instances to go extinct. Um, so I'll give a quick example for the study of environmental pollutants. And so this is an example of how genomics is now being um, applied to and understanding um, and new opportunities to kind of advance and strengthen research and understanding about pollutants in our environment. And so this is actually um, part of a study that I participated in at my previous institution um, on endocrine disrupting substances. And so endocrine disrupting substances are pollutants that enter fresh and estuarine um, environments through multiple different point sources. Um, so that might be, for example, treated sewage effluent. So if you're on city water, your water then goes out to the treatment plant and is filtered through and ends up back in the water system. Livestock runoff and agricultural runoff. And each one of these point sources might contain in really, really small concentrations, um, pharmaceuticals that can act as estrogen and androgen mimicking substances. And so these compounds elicit a really powerful effect on reproductive function in wildlife. And of course, the big question is, well, what about us, right? Um, and so even at really, really low concentrations, we're seeing wildlife that are exposed to these pharmaceuticals, very low concentrations, but they're experiencing, for example, feminization in males, which is when for example, these are the two fish that I studied. The fish on the right is a male, and so he has these beautiful stripes, this yellow belly, saying to a mate, look at how fit I am, I'm a very attractive male. Um, and then the female is on the left. And so basically, a lot of this work is focusing on pharmaceuticals that mimic these reproductive hormones, so estrogens and testosterones. Um, and one of the big areas of study uh, in this area is on EE2 or estrogen estradiol, which is the primary component of most commonly used oral contraceptive methods, right? So the birth control pill. Um, and so fish and amphibians, basically, let's just walk through this. So let's say there's a population of young women, young university women that are um, using birth control using oral contraceptives. Um, they're on city water, and so, for example, the water from their toilets, right, flushing, um, is going through the city water, going to the treatment center, going through screening, primary treatment, secondary treatment, final treatment, ultimately getting filtered. It seems like the water is really clean, and it's going back out into the natural system. And the animals that are living downstream from this effluent site um, so let's say fish and frogs are being exposed at low levels to these remnants of pharmaceuticals. Um, and so what we've been seeing in wildlife is that these fish and amphibians, um, due to this prolonged exposure, are experiencing feminization. So for example, the male fish on the left is starting to look a lot like the female fish on the right. And in addition to that, we've actually seen intersex individuals, so males that have a, um, developed female sex characteristics, including organs, and have actually started generating um, vitilogenin, which is kind of the precursor to what makes egg yolks in females. So pretty worrisome stuff. Um, 
Uh, genomics has kind of come into play because we're trying to understand at a very fine level what these pharmaceuticals are doing, right? What concentrations they're existing in our natural water systems, who's exposed to them, what kind of prolonged exposure we're looking at, and, and what kind of effects we're going to start seeing within different populations of not just wildlife, but also people, right? Okay, so um, another forefront for genomics and conservation is focused on overharvest and exploitation. Um, and so genetics is really newly being applied in what we call wildlife forensics. So it's like wildlife CSI um, to prosecute and also mitigate the impacts of illegal hunting, poaching, and also to um, prosecute and investigate um, using genetics, tracing back. So for example, um, border security, stopping an, an incoming shipment of, for example, illegally harvested wildlife products, and then using genetics to track the source of that population back to um, the wild to find out where it has been harvested. So what's, what's the wildlife population out there that has been impacted by this illegal wildlife harvest? And what can we do on the ground to mitigate, mitigate the impacts of um, that illegal activity? So these wildlife products could be skins, they could be pelts, um, and largely these days they're elephant ivory, so African elephant ivory. And so this is um, some recent work that has documented in Mozambique in particular researchers that are quickly tuning into and trying desperately to understand the genetics of elephants that are being born without tusks and proceed to not develop tusks throughout the course of their juvenile and adulthood. Um, and the consequences of these traits ecologically as elephants go throughout their lives with tusks, which they've had for thousands of years. Um, and so tusklessness in these few um, circumstances where elephant populations were really, really decimated by poaching um, has actually given them a better chance of surviving. So for example, Mozambique had a really, really long and violent civil war. Um, and the elephant population there was decimated by poaching. I think they had they experienced a 90% decline in their population due to poaching. Um, and the resulting population that has rebounded after the end of the Civil War, so the Civil War ended in 1992, one third of the females that have been born after that Civil War are actually tuskless. And so tusklessness, um, it's not just trending in Mozambique, but it's actually been documented elsewhere in South Africa and also in Tanzania. So in South Africa, 98% of elephants in Addo National Park, um, which experienced really, really heavy um, poaching in the past, were documented as tuskless um, in the year 2000. And then also in Tanzania, um, there was really, really heavy poaching in the 70s and 80s in Ruaha National Park. And as a result, now 35% of the females don't have tusks. Um, and so this is a really interesting adaptation that's happened in a really short period of time that's giving these elephants an, a, a survival advantage, right? Um, but one of the things that's been really puzzling about this is that the inheritance of tusklessness is kind of odd because all of these cases are female skewed, right? So tusklessness has really only been documented among the females. It seems like the females are the only ones inheriting this trait. And so this has led some geneticists to help hypothesize um, that um, the trait is what we call X-linked. And so women have two sex um, chromosomes. They're both X's and men have XY. And so the interesting thing about this is that men, of course, because they only have one X chromosome, they're inheriting that from their mothers, which their mother might be tuskless, but they're not, ex they're not um, exhibiting tusklessness themselves. And so ecologically, this kind of makes sense um, because male elephants would never be able to compete for, for example, breeding resources if they didn't have tusks. And so, there's kind of a missing piece of this puzzle in terms of how this trait is being inherited, but the bottom line is that these animals are adapting quickly to an incredible stressor, which is ivory poaching. <laughs>
Does anybody have any questions up until here? Okay. Um, so, climate change, of course, major threat to global diversity, um, and as climate impacts um, have affected ecosystems worldwide, wildlife managers are turning to science and basically trying to determine um, whether or not these species will be able to adapt in place or leave their current distribution and gain access to um, what we call climate refugia. And so climate refugia are basically using climate data to project into the future. Let's say we're looking at 2100 um, or 2050 and saying this animal population is living here under these suitable conditions now, but by 2050 the conditions are going to change so dramatically that this population is going to need to access a climate refugia. So likely it's going to need, need to move northward and upslope to cooler conditions. Um, and so scientists have been trying to map these climate refugia and asking kind of these three different questions to identify the species and populations that are most at risk of not being able to access suitable habitat as climate change um, impacts where they're currently residing. And so there's three kind of prongs to this integrated approach. One of them is exposure. And so, like I mentioned, that's basically mapping where our populations are existing today um, and projecting out into the future. We're looking at 2050, we're looking at 2100. Um, as you go further out into the future, the projections become less certain than the ones that are um, sooner. And so we're saying, okay, these are the populations and where they're existing and the conditions that they require today. And looking at 2050, these are the conditions, what they're gonna look like on the ground and where this population basically needs to move to to be able to persist. And so that's exposure, um, saying how different is it gonna look right here in this spot? What's the temperature gonna look like? What's the rainfall gonna look like um, in the next 25, 50, 75 years? The second thing we're looking at is sensitivity. And so sensitivity is where the genomics part of this comes into play. And so when we're thinking about sensitivity, we're taking an animal, selecting, for example, a suite of climate-related genes. And so there's kind of two different um, arenas that are commonly looked at for sensitivity, and those are cold tolerance and heat tolerance. And so within these heat tolerance, um, genes, for example, we're going to look at the population and say, what's their sensitivity? So what's their, um, what's going to be their ability to adapt to, for example, a hotter, more arid climate? Um, how much diversity does this population hold within these, let's say, 10 to 20 genes? And what's their likelihood to actually stay in place and adapt quickly to the changing environment? Um, and then the third prong of this is range shift potential. So if you cannot adapt, how likely are you to be able to easily move to um, a place that is suitable in the next 25 to 50 years under these new conditions? Okay, so there's some scientists, um, Rasger et al, that basically took this, they developed this framework and applied it to the gray long-eared bat. And so that's this little guy in the corner. Um, and so he's a European bat species with relatively limited dispersal ability. That means like he can't really go very far. Um, and so in the next 20 to 50 in the future, he's gonna be looking for suitable habitat that's nearby. Um, limited dispersal, dispersal ability. Um, and they also, bats generally have a number of traits that just make them kind of vulnerable to climate change. So they have low reproductive output, so they don't have a whole lot of pups. Um, and they also are ecological specialists, so they need their hibernaculums require really, really specific conditions. Um, and they also have these gigantic, large, um, big surface area um, to volume ratio wings, right? So they're basically just a really, really thin membrane. Um, that are gonna encourage really rapid evaporative water loss under arid conditions. And so they're not gonna do great in the heat. Um, okay, so as a result, 
these bats are going to require either A, specific physiological adaptations. They're need, going to need to change within their bodies to meet these new conditions, or they're going to need to really quickly and easily access suitable habitat. Um, okay, so the scientists combined um, the effect of these different, these three framework components, so that's sensitivity, exposure, and range shift potential, and they identified one population on this peninsula. So it's Valencia, it's on the East Coast. Um, you can see right there where I put high risk. That is the population within all of these different bat hibernaculums. So there's eight or nine of them located on this peninsula. And they identified Valencia as the one that is most at high risk um, for climate change um, by the year 2070. And so they're at high risk because the climatic suitability, basically where they're existing now, is going to go from suitable, so this is a good place to live, to completely unsuitable. And it's two of the main reasons that the climate is going to be unsuitable at that particular location is that it's, the rainfall is going to drop precipitously and the temperature is going to go up. So it's about to become very hot and very dry. Um, second, they, have, they looked at this, this handful of um, genetic traits related to heat tolerance that would potentially allow these bats to adapt really quickly to a hot and arid environment. And they weren't, they did, within the population, they didn't possess a whole lot of diversity within those genes. So it was unlikely that they would be able to rapidly develop these physiological adaptations to the new conditions that they would be exposed to. And then lastly, within the range chef potential question, um, these bats have a really limited dispersal ability, and so the nearest population or suitable habitat was right next door, um, relatively close in, I think it's called Alcante, um, and that population actually is also a medium risk for low climate suitability. And so it seems like these bats are not gonna be able to reach um, suitable habitat by the year 2070. So what does this mean if they're not going to be able to adapt quickly to climate change, and they're also likely not going to be able to move to where they need to be. Um, this finding, of course, this is like a difficult pill to swallow, but it gives us some really important information for planning into the future. So it presents us with two um, kind of different paths, right? So one path is that we can take valuable time and resources and expertise and apply those resources to the remaining seven populations, right? If we know that the Valencia population is gonna be a total loss, then that frees up some resources to allocate to the additional seven populations to make sure that those seven populations are gonna make it through 2070. Um, the flip side to that is to actually pool all our resources and focus on the Valencia population by enhancing the connectivity that they have to a nearby suitable range. So, are there any questions about that? Sorry, a little depressing. One question you have, with all of the, how many species are we talking about, millions of species facing climate change, where do the resources come from? Right, exactly, so, one? right. That's a great question because, um, you know, this is one population of one bat in Europe, and, it, and this is a lot of work. This is a time-intensive, um, study that required the expertise of some real professionals, right? And so how are we going to do this for um, species on the orders of millions that are going to need to access these climate refugia? One of the ways that some landscape scientists are going about this is that they're taking a full suite of um, species. And for example, there was a recent paper that came out um, in the last few months that across North America, mapped what's called climate corridors. And so they mapped these climate refugia for a suite of um, indicator species. So for example, a species that is really representative of a group of species that require similar habitats, um, habitat needs. And they mapped the climate refugia for them and across the continent mapped these corridors that are basically um, saying, okay, these are the um, areas on the landscape that we're going to need to preserve and monitor to allow these populations to travel northward as they need to. So that's how we're addressing that. 
I just remind her, I think that Sarah Emel gave us a good example of exactly that, <coughs> picking a, a species within the corridor from Maryland through Pennsylvania in her lecture three weeks ago. And if you didn't get that lecture, it's, it's on BCTV and it's on the Dumberton Conservation Commission website, so you can check back. So um, while we're talking about climate change, I'm going to talk about a study that um, we've just started in the last year and a half or so. Um, this is a study that's being led by the principal investigator, Tony Lynn Morelli, who works at the Northeast Climate Science Adaptation Center, um, which is also housed at UMass Amherst. So that's another US Geological Survey research-focused um, office that exists on our UMass campus. We're very lucky to have them there. Um, and just like our research co-op unit focuses on sustainable management and resource use, the Climate Change Office, of course, focuses on applied climate research here in the Northeast. And so as temperatures warm, snowpack is decreasing, rainfall patterns are shifting within the Northeast, um, animals are responding in a number of different ways. And one of the ways that animals are shifting in their behavior is that the interaction between species is actually changing pretty dramatically. So no species lives you know, in a vacuum, right? They're interacting, they're impacting each other, they're coexisting, they're fighting for resources. Um, and so this is a study that I've been collaborating on with um, Dr. Morelli and the focus is on American red squirrel in the White Mountains National Forest. And so we've been working in the Presidential Mountain Range, which is absolutely stunning. There's a picture on the um, bottom left there. And looking at how these American red squirrels are shifting in their distribution and kind of as hypothesized, they're shifting northward, but also upward in elevation into a cooler climate. And the main question um, and concern with this shifting distribution is that it's good for the squirrels. They're finding a place to hang out, right? But they're actually impinging on um, the nesting habitat of some threatened uh, northeastern birds. So for example, the Bicknell's thrush has for years been nesting safely and with limited risk um, of predation in these high elevation montane regions of the Presidential Mountain Range and the National Forest, and now that squirrel are becoming um, more prominent within that area, um, they're actually a, a major predation risk for these threatened bird populations. And so the pilot study that we're currently working on examines exactly how far these squirrels are shifting in their distribution and also their abundance in response to two things. And so we're looking at biennial mast did anybody notice that there were like a zillion dead squirrels last year? That's biennial mass. So we had a huge mass year. Squirrels were doing great. They had a zillion pups. And then half of those pups ended up, you know, on the wheels of your Subaru. So, um, so biennial mass is one thing that we're looking at. And of course, the second thing is climate change in the northeastern US. Um, yep. Also, there was a change in behavior that squirrels were swimming across rivers. Yeah. Squirrels swim. There's no, but this was a mass movement. Like lemmings. Yeah. No, people were reporting to me. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, I mean, there's all these small, small mammals that we think never swim, right? Yeah, like, yeah. people wouldn't think that a lynx would swim, but... Yeah. Yeah. They'll swim. If they, they want to get to the other side of that river, they'll swim. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, too. Um, okay. So basically, we used some genomic techniques. Um, Tony Lynn and her team went out into the White Mountains National Forest, and I did as well, to trap these red squirrels. Um, we used ti these tiny, adorable little radio collars on them to find out what they were, where they were going. <laughs> um, and we also, of course, collected DNA. And so the DNA is what I got to work with. Um, and we used some population assignment techniques to kind of describe the population that was living on a couple different peaks in the presidential mountain range and to selectively capture individuals at the highest elevation and say, where are you coming from? Are you coming from low elevation? Or are you just living here all the time now? And so when we did this pilot study, we only had about 25 samples to work with. And so we haven't been able to answer this question. Um, we're 
Tony Lynn's got this incredible intern, Maggie, who like we literally called the squirrel whisperer. And so she went back out into the White, Na White Mountains National Forest this past season. She, tra she captured another 40 squirrels. And so we're going to be adding samples to that database and looking specifically at these high elevation squirrels to determine whether or not they're actually coming up from low to mid elevation populations or if they are a persistent um, permanent population on um, this montane high elevation um, alpine area of the White Mountains, which is pre pre predominantly where these threatened birds are nesting. So, okay. All right. Well, I'm halfway through, so I got a boogie. Buckle up. <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're moving on here. And so, um, a lot of my research focuses on landscapes. And so I do what's called landscape genomics, and this is really the interface of thinking about populations and thinking about the landscapes that they're existing on. Um, and so landscape genomics aims to understand the geographical and the environmental variables um, and the features that are structuring genetic variation between individuals and among populations. But first, before we talk about these landscape genomics, which relates to my Canada Lynx research, what is a landscape? How are we defining landscape? And the definition of a landscape um, really is all in the eye of the beholder, as we say. So for example, these are four different landscapes. Um, and a butterfly might be perceiving a really small landscape on a small scale and the things that she needs. A hummingbird might be um, interpreting his landscape a little bit differently and the resources that he needs as a pollinator, right? Um, a raccoon, slightly larger landscape, perhaps looking for different resources across that landscape. And of course, um, an owl, looking at different resources that he's interested in, right? So the landscape is really in the eye of the beholder. And as a landscape geneticist, it's our job to choose variables, to choose resources um, that are relevant to the species of interest in defining what we're thinking of as the landscape, what we're looking at, and what's relevant ecologically to that species of interest. So my research um, focuses on landscapes. Again, it's this combination, this interface between landscape ecology and genetics. Um, and we um, primarily are thinking about how animals are moving across the landscape. Why do we bother thinking about this? movement across the landscape is followed by what's called gene flow. And so part of what we want to understand is how geographical and environmental features are structuring genetic variation among individuals and among populations via gene flow. Um, but let's ask, before we get there, what is gene flow? Gene flow, for example, in this um, diagram in the top right is the incorporation of genes into the gene pool from one population to the other. So population A is going over to population B via movement, right? Movement is the precursor to gene flow. You got to get there to breed, right? So individuals from population A are going over to population B and depositing their genes in the gene flow via successful breeding and production of offspring. And likewise, population B is accessing population A. So here we have bidirectional gene flow. When thinking about movement, we have two different mechanisms, right? We have dispersal, which means that an individual is permanently moving away from the birth site. We see dispersal in male juvenile lynx, right? So the mother raises them up, she gives birth to them, raises them, and then when she's ready to mate again the next year, she says, you gotta get out of here. And so the males disperse um, and they find a new place far from their birth site where they can find suitable mates that are not related to them, um, establish their own territory, and um, be successful reproducers. And then of course we also have migration um, where individuals move and breed in a population site other than their birth site. That encourages a lot of genetic mixing and so for example, um, some coastal rays will, for example, get together in these big groups and go down south and mate. Um, so that's, an idea, that's kind of an example of migration. Okay, so the main question that we're asking is how do animals move across the landscape? How connected are these populations, right? And what are the factors that are influencing 
how well these populations are connected and their ability to um, access each other and deposit genes in each other's gene flow in each other's gene pools. So why do we bother thinking about gene flow? Why is it important? Well, three main points. It prevents inbreeding, right? Um, so going to a new population where um, there is a fresh pool of individuals to meet with encourages you to select a mate that is not closely related to you. So it prevents inbreeding. It prevents population fitness depression. So I'll give a quick example of what that means. Um, basically, inbreeding can, can um, depress the fitness of a population by, for example, um, impacting reproductive success. So I'll give an example in birds where inbreeding really caused um, the hatchling success rate to be um, basically cut by 30% due to inbreeding. Um, and then lastly, it de decreases extinction risk. So we know from um, the history of this field that populations that are isolated and that are small are at high risk of going extinct. Why? Because they have a low level of genetic diversity. Genetic diversity within a population helps us adapt to stressors, um, rapid change, and helps us survive through varying conditions and also um, catastrophic events, right? Okay. So here's an example of a population bottleneck in breeding and what we call genetic rescue. And so this is the greater prairie chicken. Um, he once numbered in the millions on the um, prairie grasslands of Illinois. And um, as farmland began to take over the Illinois landscape and the um, proportion of farmland to um, native prairie grassland became super lopsided, the prairie chicken in Illinois declined in number. And so it started off in the 1930s at 25,000. By 1993, there were only 50 left. And so over the course of these 60 years, what had once been high 90s hatchling success rate, right? These birds were reproducing. They were successful in raising their young. The young were, had high fitness, and they were going on, and the, the population was steady. Um, over these 60 years, the hatchling success rate had been cut by 30% because these individuals had a very limited um, gene pool, low diversity, small number, and they were incredibly isolated. So they were not in close contact with any adjacent populations. Um, and so basically, this is um, a quick kind of uh, schematic of what I'm talking about when I say population bottlenecks. So at the top, we have the original population. There's all these different colored marbles in there. There's a bright red, there's a pink, and there's a green. Um, the population goes through this bottleneck event, where on the other side of the bottleneck, there's just a small handful of, um, of individuals that are surviving this event, right? And the genetic diversity that they have, just by chance, is, of course, a subset. So a small selection of what the original population held. And so in this example, the surviving population after that bottleneck event um, has lost one third of the genetic diversity of the population. Um, and so basically, the end of this case study, or this um, conservation um, study, was that the experts identified a nearby population that these prairie chickens were not able to um, access naturally, and they um, kind of took an extreme measure and they translocated individuals from these neighboring populations into the Illinois prairie chicken population. And the, that's what we call genetic rescue. So they were taking individuals with this novel and essential genetic diversity and literally injecting that into the, the population of the Illinois prairie chicken. Um, and the population was able to rebound. And of course, with this new genetic diversity, um, the fitness of the chicks was able to increase and so they got the fitness of their hatchlings to go back up into the 90 percentile. So. Question down there? Yep. Because of the years that you said this happened, basically the last two thirds of the 20th century, it sounds like that there were factors like uh, loss of hedgerows and and field buffers that might that might have been part of that. Is that accurate? 
That's a good question um, because, of course, when we think about landscapes, um, it's not just habitat loss, right? It's also habitat fragmentation. And so when we talk about habitat fragmentation, that means suitable habitat exists, but it's not one big contiguous piece, right? It's a lot of small fragments of this suitable native prairie grassland that maybe an individual chicken and its hatchlings aren't able to access all at one point. Does that make sense? So it's possible that that was a contributing factor, but I don't know for sure. Um, okay, so a key aspect to understanding whether or not gene flow is existing between two populations on these complex landscapes um, is to simply ask, are animals moving from one place to another? And so this is a really simple question and we can get at it with a bunch of different methods. Um, and so imagine, for example, these are two landscapes one natural and kind of untouched and one not so much. And there's an animal in each that wants to move from site A to site B. So in one instance, they have to cross a six lane interstate. And in another case, they need to cross a sizable river. So again, landscapes are all in the eye of the beholder. Thinking about species relevance is what we wanna do every time that we're talking about landscapes. And so for a salamander, the landscape on the left might not be a reasonable crossing, right? And that could be the, the case for some large felines too, right? Depending on how busy this interstate is. Um, and then likewise on the right, you know, apparently squirrels are swimming across rivers, so maybe the squirrels would be fine. But there's plenty of species that would be really averse to crossing a sizable river like that. Okay, so again, um, it's not just man-made uh, barriers that we take into consideration when we think about how animals are moving across the landscape and um, whether or not populations are able to exchange gene flow, right? So there's also um, natural landscape features like the Rocky Mountains, like, um, you know, for example, wide rivers that we take into consideration as some structures that could potentially limit the connectivity between populations. And so here is basically an example where we're using genetics to identify whether or not lynx are achieving connectivity over um, this river. And so an example of how we would find evidence of connectivity is using genetics. If we found that the three lynx on the left were identical genetically to the links on the right, then we would indicate that yes, the links have connectivity over this heterogeneous surface, right? So they're maintaining connectivity. They're able to access resources, and resources might be food, they might be mate, they might be territories on either side of this proposed barrier. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, we also want to look at relatedness across a barrier. Um, as an indicator of gene flow. So just because this lynx is able to reach the other side of the river, that does not necessarily mean that the lynx, once he reaches the other side, is depositing his genes into the population that resides there. In order to provide evidence of gene flow, we need to ask a different question. And that is, is there relatedness across this barrier? Are lynx on the left side of the river related in some way to lynx on the right side of the river? And there's two questions that we need to ask to address that. The first one is, are there females? Um, we need females to reproduce, and so that is always the primary question that we're asking. Second, are there related individuals? And so, for example, if the yellow lynx, M1, was the son of one of the females, 3F, we would find that there was relatedness across a barrier. Does that make sense? Okay. So, this has been awesome. We are applying genomics to all these really challenging issues, um, some really cool cutting edge science addressing environmental pollutants. We've talked about climate change. We've talked about wildlife exploitation um, and illegal poaching, we've talked about genetic rescue and habitat fragmentation, so why aren't we seeing more of these studies? Why aren't we applying genomics more broadly to all of our conservation questions when the applications are so broad? Um, there's a couple different answers to that. 
So a major challenge to conservation and high quality research is that most species haven't had their genome sequenced. There are no genomic resources, no genomic data that exists for the majority of species on Earth. Um, and most current genomes, so the resources that have been made available in the last two decades, have some major issues. Um, so they likely, if they were produced in the last 20 years, um, have hundreds of thousands to millions of errors in them. That means that genomes are missing parts of genes. They're incorrectly put together. Um, they have major gaps or just areas that haven't been filled in. Um, and they also might have um, just a number of um, inaccuracies, basically, or areas with very low certainty. And so researchers have gotten around using these resources by cloning, resequencing, and correcting genes individually. Um, the genome that we have created for Canada Lynx has 20,000 genomes, uh, sorry, 20,000 genes. So, I mean, good luck correcting individual errors in each one of those. Um, it's a really time intensive and expensive way to go about things. Okay. So endangered species, of course, are a high priority and critical for genome resources because we're experiencing the sixth mass extinction. We need new tools to address um, and to plan for what these species are going to need um, in terms of resources to avoid going extinct in the next 50 to 100 years. And we're currently at risk of losing actually one in eight vertebrate species. And so there are 66,000 vertebrate species, meaning species that exist, species that have a backbone, vertebrates, um, on Earth. And there is a new um, initiative that um, I'm a part of. It's a kind of a loose consortium called the Vertebrate Genomes Project that aims to sequence and provide a genome resource for 66,000 species. And so it's really a coll collaborative effort among um, bioinformaticians, field biologists, all people from all different disciplines, including myself, conservationists, um, people who specialize in evolution, to produce these resources for 66,000 individual species such that researchers like myself um, can go and find this resource and use it for whatever area of study I am working on. Um, and so I should mention that the, um, the resources produced by the Vertebrate Genomes Project, including the Canada Lynx genome that we have produced, are publicly accessible. So anybody can go and access them, researchers from evolution to wildlife disease um, to, you know, there's people working on vocal learning, trying to understand how different species communicate. Um, and of course, conservation, the, re the resources available to anybody for any interest. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so all of the um, genomes are housed on what we call the Genome Arc, um, and so it's an online database, and um, the files are on are, are all on there, including like methods of how they are produced and some basic statistics of um, about the genomes and and who worked on them and and what kind of projects are ensuing for each one of them. So it's called the Genome Arc. The Genome Arc. And you could go. Anybody can just go. Anybody can go. Yep. Is there an institutional custodian of the genome arc? Um, in some ways, yes. So the Vertebrate Genomes Project has a laboratory that is housed at the Rockefeller University, um, and that's led by Dr. Eric Jarvis. And so he was kind of the visionary behind this rather audacious project. Um, and he has been kind of curating and really mobilizing all of these um, field experts towards generating these tools for as many species as possible. And so I think the first data release had 15 genomes, um, and I'll get there in a second. And then the second one for this year is set to release another like 190. So, um, yeah. Okay. So. Another issue about um, current genomic resources is that on the at the onset of the genomics era, machines like this one on the left um, produced really, really short sequences, so they couldn't handle a whole lot of DNA. And also the um, fragments that they put out were really these little short sequences of DNA. And so using them for a large scale project, like the genome that I work on is 2.9 billion uh, base pairs long. 
it's pretty large scale. And so modern sequencers, 200 billion base pairs. Yeah, I'll, sh I'll show you what it looks like actually. Um, hold on, let me just move it along. So basically, these are, um, genome assembly is really one of the bottlenecks to getting this project done, right? So um, the cost of sequencing is down, it's easy and accessible to create, to, to, to generate the data that one requires to create a genome. The real bottleneck here is experts that are capable of taking these small fragments of DNA and actually piecing them back together into a complete genome. And so this is an example of, for example, what we work with. So imagine we're trying to complete the sentence, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And we have on the right what would have been an older sequence, the, the type of data that we would have gotten from an older sequencing method, where the fragments are really, really small. It makes it incredibly detail and error prone to piece these tiny little fragments together. What we're using modern day is on the left. So we have nice long fragments. In this example, we have full words or two words that can overlap. And we can use these overlaps to piece these um, pieces of the puzzle together. So another way that I like to think about this is to imagine that the genome is a giant puzzle. We've generated all this data. The data is the puzzle pieces. Um, and then on the left, we have kind of what was um, state of the art 10 years ago, let's say, even a few years ago, um, where the puzzle pieces are extremely small, it's difficult to assemble, and it produces a lot of errors and gaps. And image B is what we're working with today. So we have these bigger piece, pe puzzle pieces, we have large fragments, and they're much easier to put together, and we feel much more confident in the results. So this is actually a small snippet of the type of data that was produced by our genome. Um, and you are looking at about 300 base pairs of a um, gene that's called the agouti signaling protein fun name, um, the ACIP gene that has been located in most felid genomes. And the ACIP gene is actually correlated, it's, it's related to um, coat color in felids. So what makes, literally what gives the leopard its spots kind of stuff. Um, and so this is an example of the type of data that we have from our genome where we have the genome sequence, um, it's well assembled. And we also know the function of this gene. And so we're taking basically um, data from these national databases and putting that onto our genome so that we have this complete map, like a complete picture of what the genome is, where things are located, how they are regulated, and what they do. <coughs> and so as we talked about in the climate um, example, this allows us to, for example, cherry pick a suite of genes, let's say related to climate, we're looking at cold tolerance in a lynx, um, and we're able to locate those genes within the genome and say, what's interesting? What's going on in these genes? How diverse is this lynx compared to, for example, a bobcat, or compared to other felids, or compared to some really distant relative? Um, and so we're able to zoom in as much as we want and look at these really, really, um, kind of high resolution data, depending on what your question is. Okay, so another um, barrier to producing these genomes for 66,000 um, species, of course, has been sample quality. It's something that even our genome team has um, struggled with in the past, and not all samples, so this goes back to your um, museum specimen question, not all samples are optimal for generating a new genome. We're actually looking for something really high quality, viable, fresh. Why? Because if you collect, for example, a sample from a roadkill, um, immediately upon an animal's death, there's enzymes that go to work at breaking down that body, right? The process of decomposition begins immediately. And with that process, there's enzymes that are actually fragmenting the DNA. So they're breaking up cells, and within those cells, they're breaking up the DNA that we need to produce the genome. And so we actually went through several rounds of just trying to get the perfect sample, something of high enough quality 
to produce this Canada Lynx DNA uh, genome. And that didn't even compare. That didn't even come close to what some of our um, colleagues are working on. And so within these 66,000 species that this vertebrate genomes project is hoping to do, there's of course a major question of, are we even gonna be able to get a hold of one of these things? Because some of the species, and arguably these are the ones that um, really need desperately to be sequenced, they're critically endangered or, um, or they, uh, um, and, and a lot of the critically endangered ones are just, they're, they're living in remote areas, um, they require a real team of experts to locate and trap them or, or capture them. Um, they're extremely rare or cryptic, hard to find, or they're just really, really tiny, like this tiny little tree frog. Um, there's actually someone on, in our group. We've kind of formed this coalition of um, field biologists to talk about these rare circumstances where um, you know, maybe to access a leatherback sea turtle or this rare frog or, um, you know, some critically endangered critter, we need to go out into the field and the conditions are such that we don't have access to a lot of the things that we would normally have access to to get the samples that we need. And so there's a team of us that have been working together to try and extend resources and recommendations to field biologists that are in this really challenging condition, um, position, sorry, to give them some recommendations on exactly what they can do and how they can best preserve the samples that they have so that they can submit it to the lab and we can get started on this genome ASAP. Okay, so, um, so we had a call for a higher standard of species genomes and um, for most species, there weren't any resources at all. And so we had to start from scratch and that included my study species, which is the Canada lynx, um, whose genome prior to this genome project um, had never been sequenced in part or in full. Nobody had ever looked at it. No, there is no genomic resources available for the species. Um, and so we've been using basically the same genetic tools for the last um, couple decades for lynx management. Um, and so these are the 15 species that came out first for the Vertebrate Genomes Project. And this is actually a picture of the individual lynx that we harvested the sample for, um, uh, for the genome. And we harvested that over at the Tufts um, Veterinary School here, uh, not here in Massachusetts, but in Massachusetts, um, in North Grafton. And um, that was after multiple failed attempts of um, collecting samples in the field and submitting them and um, finding that samples were not of high enough quality to produce, you know, this platinum standard um, tool that we had set out to make. So, um, we completed the Canada Lynx genome in September and released it publicly. And we got some really excellent media coverage. Um, the release was actually covered by Science Magazine as well as Nature Biotechnology. Um, and there were a lot of people that were applauding us and saying, wow, like, you know, this is incredible. What an achievement for, you know, people who are hoping to use this thing. But um, how are you gonna use this thing? What does it do? <laughs> what are your plans? Um, and so now that it's available and it's out, it's been released, it's completed. Um, while it is a huge accomplishment and we're delighted that there's people interested in using it, really the work starts now. Like it's a new tool that's yet to be explored. It's a new frontier and it's really pushing um, the, you know, the type of questions that we are able to ask with this new, with this new tool. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about my, my how I'm using the genome. But first we need to talk about um, this kind of population level question, right? So we created one genome. Is it an excellent genome? Yes. Um, it's an excellent tool. We have very high confidence in um, how, it how it was created and how reliably, for example, the genes have been pieced back together and annotated. We know what each one of the genes is doing and where it's located. But there's a deeper question here, which is um, how can we address population level questions with a single genome? Because inherently, the population is the unit of study in conservation. Why? Because 
Conservation is primarily enacted by, for example, state wildlife management agencies like um, the Vermont Fish and Game. Um, and there really are very few species that just um, reside specifically in Vermont, right? So there is, most species are existing beyond political boundaries, um, state and national boundaries, and in the case of Canada lynx, of course they're in the US, but they're also predominantly in Canada. And so it wouldn't be feasible to make management recommendations for the conservation of Canada lynx based on a single lynx from Maine. And so in order to get around that question, we've had to basically reproduce this, um, go through this process again with an additional population level sampling of lynx. So we've <coughs> supplemented our one genome with 58 additional genomes. So now we have 59 genomes. But at least now, we have a population level um, data set that we can draw inferences from that are going to be relevant to conservation, right? How did you get those extra genomes? Oh, I'll get there. Um, OK, so this is the Canada lynx. And um, it's a North American felid known for, of course, its characteristic large paws um, and its bobbed tail and ear tufts. And um, you might be really familiar with its sister taxa, which is the bobcat. Um, and Canada lynx was threatened in the year 2000 um, and listed under protection of the Endangered Species Act, um, at which time there was a recovery plan that went in place. And they've actually been, they were recommended in 2018 for delisting from Endangered Species Act protections due to recovery. Um, however, despite the, um, despite believing or thinking that um, Canada lynx are gonna persist well into 2050, um, despite climate change and other threats, there are definitely some questions about how we can better manage the species. Um, and so that's where my research has really come into play. And so these are kind of the characteristic big feet of the Canada lynx, um, those little ear tufts and um, some really sharp incisors. And these are all photos that were taken by Bill Byrne over at Mass Wildlife um, when we harvested material from this individual for the um, Canada lynx genome. And after this um, interaction, he was, we actually put a GPS collar on him, and he's hanging out somewhere north of Mount Katahdin in Maine. So we're still tracking him, and he's, he seems to be doing well. Um, so again, Canada lynx and bobcat um, are two sister species that you would see actually potentially here in um, Vermont, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And they were historically regarded as members of the, um, a single species. And so the historic records for Canada lynx and bobcat are really challenging to um, tease out because, for example, trapping records from the 1800s, the two species are always listed as lynx. Um, so that doesn't really do us a whole lot of help. But basically the two species, the main differences are that bobcat don't have those prominent ear tufts, um, and they also have a black tip tail with white underneath, whereas lynx have a completely black tip tail. Um, and of course, the difference in the um, foot size and that characteristic facial ruff that you would see on a Canada lynx are all kind of distinguishing features between the two. Um, and of course, ecologically, there's kind of two major differences. So the bobcat is a real generalist. So it's um, got a really broad distribution across um, um, the U.S. and southern Canada, and, and bobcat will predate on anything. They'll eat a mouse or they'll take down a mule deer, um, and Canada, Canada lynx are serious um, specialists, and so they really rely upon snowshoe hair. Um, snowshoe hair and Canada lynx um, are very, very closely tied in their population fluctuations, and um, snowshoe hare make up about 90% of the Canada lynx diet. Okay. So this is our study area. And these red dots are 542 samples that we had access to. To access the additional 58 genomes that we required to make these population level inferences. And kind of relating back to the landscape questions that we looked at, we're interested in 
what is called the St. Lawrence River. So we're looking right now at the northeastern United States. So that's the state of Maine, New Hampshire, um, and what's what we call the Gas Bay Peninsula and um, the adjacent areas on the north side of the St. Lawrence River. And so the reason that we're interested in the, north, in the St. Lawrence River is that um, it's proposed to be a barrier to movement of Canada Lynx across the river. At, at its widest points, the river is about a mile, a mile wide. Um, so it's a pretty, I actually think I have a project of, uh, there you go. So um, it's actually a major shipping lane. And so historically, ice bridges used to form over um, the St. Lawrence River that would allow um, links from Maine and this area south of the river to cross the other side and, of course, um, uh, per, you know, per, deposit their genes in the gene pool north of, of the river. Um, but that ice bridge, partially due to maintaining shipping lanes and partially due to climate change, um, has, of course, not been occurring for quite some time. And so south of the St. Lawrence here, we have some telemetry data in the um, upper left corner that indicates that basically we had collared a number of individuals from northern Maine to see if we could detect some individuals that were able to reach the other side of the river, and we did not. So we found that all of the dispersal events um, were south of this river. Another question, of course, is due to climate change, um, as I mentioned, species are going to be needing to shift either upslope or northward. And so if um, the tip of this peninsula is the farthest northward that Canada Lynx and Maine can reach in the next hundred years to access these climate refugia, then it means that really they would benefit from some connectivity to reach the population and also available resources on the other side of this river. And so basically what we did is, if you see all these dots, um, we selected 52, sorry, 58 samples from these um, samples. And so there's multiple different um, sample sources. One of the main ones is that the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife works really closely with um, the trapping community um, in the fall. And the trapping community, when they're setting legal traps for things like coyote, for example, they may incidentally capture a lynx. And so they call basically the lynx hotline um, at the main in Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife um, on these instances, and a biologist comes out and ensures that the Canada lynx has not been injured by the, by the trap. They give them some por supportive care, and it presents an awesome opportunity to collect some DNA, so to collect a sample from these individuals. And so pr predominantly the samples that we collected um, are from these incidental events um, where we've actually had an opportunity to handle lynx out in the field, collect a sample, and then release them. And in some instances, um, we had GPS collars that at the same time we could collect a sample, put a GPS collar on them, and then we had kind of associative data with these samples where we had movement data like this, where we knew exactly where that individual animal was moving um, for the next, for example, nine and 12 months. Okay, so there's two major questions that we're looking at with these um, 50 genomes, and of course, uh, one of them is certainly centering around gene flow. And so we're interested in whether or not this St. Lawrence River, which is pictured on the right, is serving as a barrier um, restricting gene flow between links in Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Um, and I should also say New Hampshire and Vermont, now that there's been a confirmed resident um, den of Canada Lynx in Vermont in 2012. Um, and we're, we're predominantly asking whether or not these animals south of the river are going to be able to access resources north of the river, and if they are not able to, ac to access them, um, what we can do to basically design a conservation action or some kind of plan that would enhance the connectivity between those two areas. The second question that we're interested in is demographic history. So basically, like forecasting is looking forward, we're backcasting and looking back into the past. Um, and we're interested in reconstructing 
the recent demographic history. So the contemporary, um, for example, potential bottlenecks, um, potential population expansions, um, among this population of Canada Lynx in Maine and parts of Eastern Canada and saying, okay, where are we now within this historic range of variation, right? Because populations ebb, ebb and flow. But from a conservation perspective and from a management perspective, it's really helpful to piece together this demographic history to be able to say, actually, um, given what we know, we're at a population high or we're at a population low or the population is declining, but it's still within the range of what this population has typically done over, say, the last 20 to 50 years. And so the second piece of this is really just um, providing kind of that context to evaluate where the population is right now in terms of abundance um, and putting that in context of the last 20 years and what has happened on the landscape. So for example, there was a huge spruce um, budworm outbreak in the 1970s and 80s, and that of course influenced um, the, species, the population in that area. Additionally, you know, it was listed and then went through this recovery plan. And so it's kind of giving us a little bit of background and a little bit of context to understand when we make an estimate today of what the Canada Lynx abundance looks like in this area, where are we at? So those are the two major questions that we'll be looking at um, with the 59 total genomes that we've generated for Canada lynx in this area. And um, in summary, I'll just do a quick recap of what we talked about. So um, it's good to remember that genomes are like books, chromosomes are like chapters, and genes are like sentences. Um, and within those sentences, a single letter can change the meaning of um, a sentence. And genomics has been used to better understand how major threats to biodiversity, um, including climate change, environmental pollutants, habitat fragmentation, and illegal wildlife exploitation are impacting um, animal populations and causing declines, and in some cases, extinctions. And lastly, genomes haven't been generated yet for most species, but we're working to change that. So with that, I will thank you and take any questions that you might have. Um, do, do we know how lynx may, will lynx be able to adapt to a warmer climate or will, will they have to go north and go, uh, or go up? So at this point, um, it's not likely that lynx are going to be able to adapt to a warmer climate. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that um, their big paws and their thick fur, so lynx are really adapted to a cold climate. And currently, um, the adaptations that they have give them basically a competitive advantage over generalist carnivores like bobcat um, or even coyote, um, which the rest of the year would likely outcompete them. And so if they're to lose this you know, seasonal competitive advantage that they have over the winter, when, where they're the apex predator, right? They're able to float over this um, dense snowpack and, and persist in really cold climates where otherwise generalist carnivores aren't able to. Um, if they lose that competitive advantage, they're likely to just be outcompeted for resources by generalist carnivores that are going to um, come in and take over you know, resources and territory. So. So yeah, their best bet is really to track suitable habitat where they can find it and to maintain access to um, and connectivity to those resources as they're shifting. How far does the, the St. Lawrence continue as a barrier? Is it That's a good question. So we, um, we don't know, right? So, so at its widest, the St. Lawrence is about a mile wide. and. Um, there's some areas, of course, where you might say on this map, like, okay, well, it looks like it's okay down, you know, downstream. It looks pretty good. Um, but actually, Quebec is kind of abutting um, a lot of those areas. And so the areas north of the river where feasibly an animal could cross easily, it's actually really urbanized and built up. Um, and unlike, you know, bobcat, which is a generalist, you might find a bobcat in town. I mean, I've, I've seen bobcats, you know, in pretty urbanized environments because they are such spectacular generalists. Um, we don't really know that a Canada lynx is going to be daring enough, right, to 
move through such an urbanized and heavy agricultural environment to get through to suitable habitat on the other side. So, Are there any uh, big cats from the southern part of America, uh, Central America or Mexico, that might head north? That is a really good question. I actually haven't had anybody ask me that previously. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, not if we get the wall, right? <laughs> um, I really don't know. Yeah. Just question, have you emotionally gotten attached to links at this point? No. Okay. No. And, um, you know, I think part of it is um, I just don't, I just don't feel that way about individual wildlife. And I think part of it is that as a wildlife professional, right, like this is, we're approaching these animals from a different perspective. And so my mom, for example, constantly is like, what's his name? And I'm like, he doesn't have a name. And the reason he doesn't have a name is because he's a wild animal conferring, for example, a name to an, you know, a wild individual kind of um, insinuates ownership. And in my profession and what we do, we don't own wildlife, nobody does. So I know that, all yes. of that, but whether or not you personally, or since you're studying the lynx so much, whether you feel just, just something about that. I definitely, I mean, yeah. Genomes. I just ask you from a big perspective. Yeah, I mean, of course I feel something about them. Um, you know, I got, I think part of it, um, working with charismatic, what we call megafauna, which, you know, pr prior to this project, I worked in African elephants, and the people who work in African elephant conservation are like so passionate, of course, and it's like all they want to talk about. Um, and I definitely, I do feel passionate about Canada lynx and felids generally, but honestly, like, I could be working on a salamander. I could be working on a snail and just be like, this is the coolest snail. Like, I just, um, I have a real passion for biodiversity and, um, just appreciating, you know, the full suite of what's out there, so. What's the relative size of bobcat and tame lynx? Um, the relative size, so bobcats definitely range from, for example, like 9 to 49 pounds. Like, they can be sizable. Um, Canada lynx have a smaller range but they're about the same size. So um, the one that we handled in that picture, I think was about 30 pounds. And I would describe them as like a small to medium sized dog, I guess. So actually a couple of times that I've seen bobcats out in the wild, I've been like, oh, a dog. And then I was like, that's not a dog. Um, that's a bobcat. So they're, they're not small, but they're not, um, they're not a house cat, but they're, they're not a mountain lion either, you know? Um, yeah. yep. Is there a sexual dimorphism, uh, you know, males versus females? Yep. Like, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Actually, no. And so, oftentimes in the field, for example, when we get these calls from the trapping community, someone calls the hotline and says, um, you know, I've accidentally caught a lynx in this foothold trap. Can you come out and assess it, um, and and I'll release the lynx. And so we go out, and from the field, we'll kind of like you know, crouch down so as not to stress the animal and look at them from a distance. And you can't tell um, based on size or otherwise whether or not they're male or female. And so you really need to um, sedate them before you can assess um, what, what they are. So. And, and what do you sample to, to pull your, your DNA? Do you have a tissue sample? Or? Yep. Um, so we do tissue and we do, um, we take a small tuft of hair and when we can, we do blood too. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that um, sample storage can be really challenging. We have samples going back to 1999. And so if you can have multiple copies of things, um, you know, preferably something that can be dried or that can be stored long term, you know, not in a freezer or refrigerator or something that can just, you know, be, be put away so that 20 years from, from now we can go back and, and, and that material will be viable. So. I wonder if you could say a word about uh, the adequacy for funding for this. Maybe um, you're not applying yourself, but certainly your mentors are. I'm just wondering, is it adequate? Uh, what does the future look like in this area? 
Um, that's a great question. Um, so Warren and I actually, Warren Johnson, Bill's son, and I um, wrote the original funding for this project. Um, and we submitted what's called the Pittman-Robertson um, grant to the wildlife and sport fish restoration at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so if there are any sportsmen or sportswomen in the room, um, when you buy a firearm, for example, there's a 12% excise tax that comes out of that fireman, firearm purchase um, and goes into the Pittman-Robertson fund. And so um, there is the state holds these funds and they're kind of earmarked for conservation. Um, and the species that that research can be funded under are really specific. And so Warren and I wrote one of these grants, submitted it, um, and it was accepted. That was in like 2015. And then since then, you know, our genome was heavily subsidized um, by the, the Vertebrate Genomes Project. Um, and so I would say we're well funded, but at the same time, you know, cautious. And of course, there's limits to what we can do. And um, within any species, you know, it, the conservation field, we're all just fighting for resources right now. Um, and it's a constant um, battle to just get more funding because without funding, we can't explore, you know, additional avenues of research because we need data, we need, you know, we need salaries, <laughs> we need benefits, et cetera. So, um, yeah. so as, we, as we discussed during the, the break, um, one of the, uh, solutions to these problems is to fix climate change. Yes, I mean, I, I didn't, so, yes, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, you're collecting information that, you know, will impact that, but it seems to me that uh, some of the big players, uh, I suspect that NIH has a much bigger budget than do the conservation genomics people, yeah. but there's the Gates Foundations and others. Are, are inroads being made, uh, arguments made, made to them that the long-term health of humans uh, is going to be greatly impacted. That's, that's a good question. I think you make um, a valuable point that climate change is a human issue, um, that it is a human issue, and it's not just about the wild environment, but it's also about the ecological benefits and the functions that we rely upon, which is clean air, clean water, and um, suitable, suitable places for us to live, right? And so um, I think, yes, um, the case is certainly being made. I think it's been reliably made, and now it really the, the the next step is to mobilize our representatives. And so I think you you know you and I briefly talked about the Green New Deal, which um, you know it is is slowly gaining support. But I think there's a lot of people that are squabbling about, for example, the details. And I don't even agree on most of the details. But really, the center of all that is that now is the time to mobilize, right? Damn the details. We'll figure that out later. The point is that now is the time to contact your representative to get them on the hook in supporting actual legitimate and substantial climate action now um, and to resolve the, de the details and what that's going to look like um, through the legislative process. So, yep. Uh, since you brought up Warren. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to ask you some, uh, your impression of the <coughs> data that he and Stephen O'Brien published in Scientific American that showed that domestic cats uh, <coughs> segregated from all of the wild species back, uh, way back, and the common ancestor is already extinct. Uh, given that, uh, could you comment on the gene segregation that has happened between domestic and wild species. Sure. And just kind of maybe a fruitless question, uh, do those domestic cats, when they run into the wild ones, do, are, do the two recognize any kind of uh, genealogical familiar <laughs> uh, family uh, uh, Yes. That's an excellent question and actually an active area of conservation research because um, when domestic um, cats interface with wildlife populations, um, they do hybridize. So a perfect example of that is the Scottish wildcat. Um, the Scottish wildcat, the African wildcat, the European wildcat, 
Um, they all look like, you know, early versions of what the domestic cat house, uh, house cat looked like. And that's because the original um, cat species that was domesticated, that was the first um, cat domesticated in the Fertile Crescent, you know, a couple million years ago, um, was actually a wild cat. And because the divergence time is actually not very long, let's say it's 10,000 years, um, these cats, these domestic cats are able to, when they do interface with wildlife species, so for example, the Scottish wildcat, they're causing major conservation issues. Um, so they're hybridizing with Scottish wildcat and actually compromising the fitness and the survivability and the resilience of these wildcat populations by basically injecting their like, you know, kind of watered down sad domestic genes into this wildlife, um, this wild population of, of, um, of felids. And so in addition to that, um, disease interface is another area of study where these domestic animals, for example, that have um, FELV, if you've heard of that, um, um, feline leukemia or, or um, you know, immuno, um, compromising diseases that are com really common in, um, in domestic cats, they're interfacing with wild populations and passing that on. So um, yes, they do. They do interface, they do mate, um, they do hybridize, and we've found that um, you know, most evidence points to it's not a good thing. Um, I will just briefly mention the paper that Bill is talking about, which is um, there's, it, was, it was ultimately published in um, Science Magazine and then in the Scientific American, and they used um, genetics across the, the 37 different species of um, wildcat to basically map out the radiation of wildcats, so where they started, what was their earliest ancestor, and how the wildcats radiated out across you know, five different continents, they're in Asia, they're in South America, they're in North America, um, they're in Europe and Africa. Um, and what kind of the, basically just mapping out and kind of um, stepping back and, and trying to piece together, you know, what a map like this looks like. So this is a second wave of feline migrations where, for example, the puma moved from South America to North America via um, the Isthmus of Panama. And so we see all of these, um, these long range movements of, of wildlife populations. And this was roughly, um, I think 2.5 million years ago that a lot of this was happening. Um, and that was a time when the seas were really ri you know, rising and falling. And then that was followed by a glaciation period during the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago. Um, which further, for example, diverged species like bobcat and Canada lynx via glaciation, physically separating them and allowing them to speciate as their own in their own groups and in their these isolated populations for um, tens of thousands of years. So, so in in your map are the uh, American bobcats the closest relation to the Canada lynx? Yes. So yeah. um, bobcat and Canada lynx were both. Um, they diverged from the Eurasian lynx, which is, um, there's four different species in the lynx genus, so there's Iberian, Eurasian, bobcat, and Canada lynx, and the bobcat and the Canada lynx, I don't know if you can see this, it's, it's M4, it's the movement from, um, from one continent to another, and so the bobcat and the Canada lynx came <laughs> over um, from the, they, they diverged from the Eurasian lynx population, and then through, through the process of glaciation, basically were further split up where lynx were exposed and, and became adapted and specialized to these really cold, cold habitats and bobcat were pushed um, south and they adopted a more generalist um, strategy for survival. Just a comment from that map, the pathway furthest to our right uh, seems to indicate a link between the Florida panther and uh, species in uh, South America. Yeah, so um, the puma, uh, the puma lineage really um, kind of moved between North America and South America. And again, this was a period when um, the sea levels were rising and falling, followed by a period of glaciation. 
And so, um, and, and during the glaciation, the Pleistocene, we actually lost a lot of, you know, mega fauna that I'm sure you would have heard of, like the woolly mammoth and um, the American cheetah, I think. Um, and so, yes, this is kind of demonstrating that the puma originally moved from North America to South America. And South America at the time, um, animals in South America, predominantly marsupials, had been speciating on their own in South America in these forests um, for a couple of million years. And so they had the thing like pretty down pat. There were like marsupials um, that were aerial. They were living in trees. They were boreal. Um, they were eating insects. They were kind of doing all these um, they had developed all these different niches and then the puma came down and then split off into what's called the ocelot lineage too. Um, and the felids when they got down there saw these little marsupials with no way to defend themselves and just absolutely decimated the marsupial populations. Um, and even in order to access some of the marsupials which were arboreal, which were up in the trees, developed um, the ability to climb to get up high in order to get those.